Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Bud, how's it going? Uh, I'm a 10 out of 10 today. Happy as a bunny in a field of clover. It's a good day. Really? Yeah. You're mentioning 10. I don't see you looking like Bo Derek, mate. <laughs> I better. Yeah, if you look like Bo Derek to me, I think I really need some serious help. Yes, you do. Yeah. I would be worried too. Yeah. So, so uh, who we got on the show today? Hey, my friend and mentor, Scott Hopper, is going to be with us today. Uh, you know, Scott was a resident at Washington State when I was a student there. He's been a, a friend of mine and a mentor to me for a long time and happy to have him on the show. Okay. That's, that's, that's good, yeah. I mean, Scott's a real character. So um, is he responsible for you coming to Root and Riddle? He actually is, yeah. He, um, he, he wrote a letter of recommendation for me, and he and I basically came at exactly the same time. He finished up his residency the same time I graduated, and, and uh, I, I haven't spent a minute here without him. So basically I have him to blame. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's something I've wondered about for some time. <laughs> that's, that's the guy right there. Okay. Well, um, welcome to the show. Uh, today we're talking to doc- Dr. Scott Hopper of the Surgery Service at and Riddle, and he's going to talk to us about colic. Scott, welcome to Stallside. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, Scott. Good to be with you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a bit about yourself. <laughs> uh, 62190. No, wait, that was high school. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I don't know what you want to know. Um, Wisconsin boy, living in Kentucky, work on some horses. What got you into veterinary medicine? Uh, fascination with horses when I was a kid. Um, did a book report on Clydesdales in the sixth grade, I think was the starting point. And, but I didn't start working with horses until I, or didn't really touch a horse until I was about 20 or 21. Got hooked up with a veterinarian, did equine work. Mm-hmm. And um, I couldn't even put a halter on that time well you've come a long way since then so um what were you going to do you sort of said you got hooked up with horses and obviously you had a veterinary bent didn't really have much of a plan when i first went to college i went to marquette uh, i thought law school sounded good they made they made some money so um or made some bank as my kids would say <laughs> now so uh after a year that wasn't really the thing so i got you know, I worked at a humane society and stuff like that, and then got hooked up with a veterinarian that I spent oh uh, six or seven years you know, during during um, undergrad and vet school. I spent every summer with them, and it was kind of all over from there. Okay, what brought you to Central Kentucky at Root and Riddle? Hey, wait, we, we we skipped a big portion of this, right? No, not yeah, no, oh, yeah, no, 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 not yet. Just okay, your okay, time's, your okay, time's okay. my time's coming. Good. Just relax. Okay. <laughs> so, um, this veterinarian that I worked with. Um, his significant other at the time was coming to Kentucky to look at horses off the track. So she wanted someone to ride along. I'm like, I'll go. I haven't seen Kentucky. So that time it was a couple of years after Rudin Riddle had, or yeah, probably a year or two after Rudin Riddle had just opened. So, um, I met a veterinarian down here named Terry Garros and, um, I asked him if I could come spend some time with him. So I came down that summer for a few weeks, slept on his couch and, he came by Root and Riddle to drop some stuff off, and I was like, you know, walked in the front door, saw the big viewing window, watched Bramwich do surgery, and I'm like, whoa, this is cool. And so then, you know, I knew that, uh, you know, they had internships, and actually an old Wisconsin grad was doing an internship here, doing an internship here at the time. So I, um, you know, once I got into vet school finally, and you know, it was time for internship time, I applied and got lucky. Mm. We can hear from the cheap seats now. What do you want to ask? Well, what he wants coming. He, it's coming. Yeah, what he wants to know. I'm patiently waiting. Yeah, this is his part. Is that um, after I did my my internship, I obviously applied for residency, and I went to Washington State for my surgery residency. So that's where I met Dr. Barber because Dr. Barber was a student. Mm. I was not Dr. Barber then. No, yeah. he was just Bart. Yeah, yep, yeah, at the time. Yeah. So still just lowly Bart. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he was a student when I was a resident. So. We actually came back here, you know, when they called me up and said, hey, you know, we're looking for a new surgeon, you know, you're willing to come back. Uh, it was the same time Bart was just getting ready to graduate, and it was the first year they had a ambulatory internship mm-hmm. here at the practice. And so I told them about it, and, um, you know, I said, dude, this, you know, this, this would be a great thing if you really, if that's really what you want to do. So Bart ended up, loaded up the family, and, 
moved to Lexington. I applied. We came here the same day. And now I have a vivid memory of, of <clears throat> me and Scott Hobbegger on emergency duty and the call that came in and young Dr. Hopper was on the case. <laughs> I know where this is and going. I can remember being in the surgery with him in the middle of the night and we are, we're all it's just dead tired and we're all singing. Do you remember what song we were singing? Pro- probably not. Faith Hills, This Kiss. All three of us singing at the top of our lungs. It's one of my greatest memories from vet school. Scott Hobbegger is a classmate of Bart's. So actually, my my one memory of Bart at the time is <laughs> Uh-oh. this: that Washington State opened up a new vet school. And um, so we were working up a We had a colic working up. Bart was up, one of the students on. And the lab is like a half a mile away. <laughs> so... You know, I let the students there kind of work up the colic. I go to walk the blood back. I'm coming back, and I hear this god-awful noise coming from the treatment room. <laughs> well, what happened is the students decided to do stuff. No one was hanging onto the horse. The horse leaped over the front of the stocks and was stuck, had a stifle stuck on the front stall, the front of the partition in the stocks. Bart and I had to, grab, had to grab the horse's tail, throw it off, and then get the horse up. And I told yeah. him, because I, I, was, I was doing the emergency job at that time, and I told Bart, I was like, um, see, that's, that's why I tell you to always hang on to the head of the horse when you guys do stuff. <laughs> mm. You know, perhaps you don't need to do a belly tap without hanging on to the horse. I don't know if that's yeah. true. And in other news, Faith Hill was on line four sending a, a cease and desist letter <laughs> yeah. to you guys. There were a lot of them. Yeah. It was not pretty. You basically <laughs> killed, you've killed the late 90s for me right then and there. We, okay. were, we were good, actually. It was good. Yeah. I mean, the voice must have been a little bit higher back then. We were talented. Yeah, and, y- and young. Yeah. No, it was, it was good. It was good singing. It was nice. It's, it's a vivid memory for me, even though it was 20 years ago. 20 yeah, years I wasn't there and already I'm traumatized. So um, we're here today to talk about colic because, unfortunately, that's something that um, comes in the door a lot. And doing as much emergency duty as you have done in your career at Rudin Riddle, you're probably really well placed to talk about things. So what is it? What are the unique features of the equine intestinal tract which causes colic to be such a common presentation to this clinic? Well, it's actually a great design if you're an emergency surgeon because it's um, job security. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, horses have a, a large amount of, of uh, intestinal tract, and it's only attached to a few points, so it's very movable. And so they are prone to colic and get things stuck in places that they shouldn't. So, um, you know, that's what leads to a lot of it. I mean, obviously we see our more than our share here because of all the horses in this area. You know, the kind of colics we see here, you know, are, are a few different types, but different. We, there's some colics that we don't see here that are more prone to, you know, southern, southwest California, Arizona type of stuff and Florida um, in other parts of the country that we don't get a lot of just because of the area that we're in. So in, on the flip side, you know, we see more large colon vulva smears, which you guys have already talked about before, than any other part of the country because of all the brood mares that are in town since they're the high-risk category. What's your opinion on the unique thing about postpartum mares leading to colon torsion? I mean, this is something we all struggle with. What's, uh, what's the tale according to Scott Hopper? Well, well actually, I mean, the, the high-risk time is actually the last three months – before they fold in the first three months afterwards. So it's actually not, the thought was always that it's, it's because they just fold and now they have all this extra room in their abdominal cavity and that's why they flip. To me, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because they'll flip it when they're pregnant too mm-hmm. and when all the space is taken up. And it's actually surprising that they actually don't have more problems, you know, because when you cut a pregnant mare, all of their colon is just wadded up against their diaphragm. And all push forward, so they get they get it all displaced and pushed out of place. But they seem to always get it back most of the time. So, um, but you know, the mares in the springtime flipping their colons is obviously very common for us here. And you know, there's unfortunately, I don't, there's no way you're going to prevent it. And some farms end up having a they'll have a rash of them one year and then not have a bunch of them, then have very few for the next several years. So there's really no rhyme or reason as to why. Mm-hmm. But you know, it happens frequently. Any other parts of the large bowel which can cause an issue? <laughs> Pretty much every part can cause an issue. <laughs> 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 Just pick your part. You know, I mean, if you're talking about broodmares, you know, they are prone, obviously prone to vulvuses. 
And then they also will get mesenteric rents secondary to foaling and get their piece of intestine stuck through it. So, you know, small colon is one, ar- one area that we always check that you'll find even as an incidental finding in a vulva smear, you'll find that they've got an old rent and their small, mes- small colon mesentery. And it's not a source of a colic right now, but it very well could be in the future. So obviously we, those are the things that we check. And the other spot is up by their duodenal colic ligament. They get a tear there. And that's easy to miss in a pregnant mare because it's a spot that's hard to get to. Um, but, uh, you know, those are some of the more common things that we'll see secondary to, you know, in mares and secondary to foaling. Okay. What about cecal issues? You know, we don't see as many. I mean, you can see some. The Probably the bigger problem in broodmares particularly is cecal ruptures. And because I think during the foaling process, they get bruised. And you will see that if you, cut a, if you do colic surgery on a, preg- on a mare post-foaling, you'll see bruises throughout the colon and throughout the mesentery, especially small colon mesentery. You can almost see perfect footprints in their colon mesentery. Um, and I think they get their, the base of their colon bruised to a point where it gets necrotic and they eventually rupture. And so you'll see, you'll see that. You know, cecal dysfunction where they just lack motility or cecal impactions aren't typical for broodmares. I mean, cecal impactions are typically um, racehorses post-surgery. Those are the ones that are can get cecal. That's the high risk for cecal impactions. How do these mares present? You know, you've detailed a few problems with the cecum. How do those mares present when they come in the door, and how do you tell them apart from the other problems? Well, it's just all in the workup. I mean, some of those mares don't come in um, as true colics. They come in as more dull depressed. And um, so that can be, I mean, have a s- similar presentation to a, a uterine tear mare where they're, they're not really colicky, but they're dull, depressed, can have a fever, and just look really dumpy is how they present, more so than a typical colic that is painful and uncomfortable that way, you know, so they can present a little bit different. Um, you know, if they do end up getting a cecal impaction, those horses can get relatively painful like any other normal colic. Okay. Um, other parts of the bowel sort of coming forward, small intestinal issues. Well, in regards of what we typically see, yeah. well, it's, it depends on age group. You know, if, you're, if you have a foal, it's pretty much a small intestinal valveless until proven otherwise. That's the most common thing that, you know, you guys yeah. send us. Yeah. Um, is the big thing. Um, you know, in older horses, you know, teenagers, um, strangling lipomas are a big part of it. I mean, you see those, that stuff, and, you know, when you give an 18, 19-year-old horse that's got a small intestinal problem, it's that until proven otherwise. Um, you know, and then... Also in, well, even in younger, but it, mostly younger horses, but even in some you know, older horses are um, either small intestinal intussusceptions or in, you know, yearlings, you'll see cecal colic intussusceptions um, or ileocecal. You know, foals often get just like jejunal, jejunal intussusceptions where they just telescope on itself. For the people that don't know what intussusception is, is basically the, it, the intestine just telescopes into itself. So a small intestine, it just, you know, one part goes into the other part. If it's ileocecal, then your ileum, which is the end of the small intestine, actually goes into the cecum. And those ones are often associated with tapeworms because tapes like to migrate there. So I think it has something to do with that and the motility that causes them to, to do that. Yearlings seem to be the ones that get the cecal colic in susceptions. And those can be pretty bad because often you can't get those reduced and get them back out. Mm-hmm. So... Um, that's often the kind of stuff we'll see with those. So but on, on most of these, you, can, you might have a suspicion of what's going on, but you never really know till you take a look, right? No. I mean, you know, with ultrasound, you know, you can pick up on some of these things, but you can miss a lot on ultrasound because you only see a certain part of their abdominal cavity. Um, but, yeah, we can have suspicions, but, yeah, you, you truly don't know what you've gotten to get in there. That's the fun part of it. It's like Christmas every time. <laughs> <laughs> so you still enjoy doing them, though? Oh, yeah, of course. Because, like I said, you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. And, so, I mean, you know, the, the vulvaless mares are probably the most easy ones to predict, you know, because you know what you're going to get, and you can go in and knock them out, and you're done. But some of the other ones, you know, like the small, the foals are the same. You know, they're small intestine. It's the matter of how bad it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of them, yeah, you go in, you're like, whoa, I, yeah. I wasn't expecting that. But we, we're, we're t- <clears throat> you are routinely saving horses now that, that weren't before because colic surgery is relatively a, a new procedure, correct? I mean, colic surgery itself has been long forever. I mean, heck, 
You know, if you talk to Dr. Emerson when he was an intern, they did. <laughs> if that's forever ago. Yeah. That's pretty long ago. L- Lincoln was president. <laughs> it was close. Um, you know, they actually were doing bare-armed colic surgeries at the place he did his, his, his internship. Wow. And, you know, so colic surgery has been a long, a long time. I think some of the techniques changed, you know, because a lot of people think just because a horse has a dead piece of gut or dead piece of small intestine that they have a poor prognosis and they will just euthanize them. So they won't do a resection. And, and, um, same with age, you know, if a horse is 20 or 22 and has a problem, they'll just put it down as opposed to do surgery where, I mean, here we're fortunate because, you know, we're not quite as financially strapped on, you know, for some, I mean, I've done colic surgery on horses that have been 25 and 30 and done resections and they've done fine, mm. you know? And I mean, of course, age brings down some, you know, its own issues, but, um, you know, they can, they can do just as well as others. So, you know, the tech, some of the techniques change. You, you get reports come out for, you know, you can do a one-layer anastomosis as opposed to two-layer people report and stuff like that. But really, I wouldn't say that the techniques used in colic surgery have changed during my career significantly at all. Gotcha. You talked about ultrasound before. So just stepping back for the general workup, when, when the adult horse walks into the hospital – and it's colicking. What's your approach to the workup? What's important? What do you look for first? What sh- how do you go through this? I mean, the workup for us is all. I mean, it's so systematic now because we, you know, we have a routine here of how we do everything. So, you know, they come in, they go in the stocks, or they go in the induction stall, depending on their degree of discomfort or willingness to go in stocks. And you know we have a team that, that works on them, so we get the colic worked up in a very quick period of time. And if they're severely painful, I mean they can be on the table in less than ten minutes mm-hmm. if need be. So I mean they routinely get you know routine blood work done. Um, they get an abdominal ultrasound, rectal, depending on their severity of their pain. We probably don't, we don't do as many abdominal centesis or belly taps on them depending on the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, you know they get a catheter placed, obviously. So. A lot of stuff happens in a very, very short period of time here. And so that's the nice thing of having interns and techs and support staff that we do. So, you know, we can make the decision pretty quick. If it's bad enough, I mean, we can have a horse on the table literally in less than 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And time for some of these things, time is everything. I mean, especially for large colon vulva smears. That's why, you know, the success rate in central Kentucky is significantly higher than anywhere else in the country. It's just because we get them faster. So, I mean, national survival rate for those is 35% in read literature. And here it's 80. And that's only, and it's not because people are bad elsewhere and that we're that good. It's just that we get them faster. So, yeah, that's important. It's that's really important. important. Yeah. As Emerson says, time is trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, it, and just people on the farms with the experience recognizing yeah. when, they've, when they've got a problem and just loading them up. So, yeah. And you mentioned a belly tap, right? Um, how does that guide your decision making? You say we don't always do it, but when you do use it, what are you looking for, and how does it help you? It's the, abdominal synthesis or belly taps can be very deceiving, and so if they have a elevated, a high elevated white count, you know that may be or have a degree of peritonitis that may dictate that you take them. So in some of the post folding mares, they come in a little colicky, not right, and they'll have a two hundred thousand white count in their belly tap. Well, they're leaking somewhere, mm-hmm. so obviously they go to surgery. Um, they're not always painful, per se, but um, they still need to go ab- abdominal exploratory. Whereas for colics, I mean, you're looking for protein level, lactate, things of that nature, but no one test will dictate exactly whether you have to take a horse to surgery or not. And part of that's just gut feeling. And you can have normal belly taps on horses that have ruptured. I just had one this past weekend. Mm-hmm. 1200 white count and I knew he was ruptured and he's and the white count was still the same five hours later mm. and so you can do you know you can do histology and do, do cytology and do slides and look for intracellular bacteria but that's not something you're going to do at two in the morning you know so um and you know lactate is another thing that we look at both you know systemically and abdominally but I mean, I had a mare, which I mean, you probably heard about her a couple, a couple of weeks ago. She had a lactate of 17, which is god-awful high, and usually mm-hmm. something's dead. She just had a displacement. Mm-hmm. Uh, she may have another reason for it, but eventually she lined out and she did fine. But, you know, um, 
so that not everything fits the rule, you know, so you could, a lot of, and part of, I think probably the biggest challenge for colic, for colics and working them up is part of is using, you know, your diagnostics and stuff, but part of it is just truly a gut feeling and your decision making as to do you resect, not resect. I mean, those, that's what makes colic surgery a little more challenging is the decision making process once you get in there. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right in what you say, and that should be something that's emphasized is that no one test is absolute. Like you read the literature, they're trying to look for one value to say this is going to be this survival, that survival. And a lot of the time that the results of that fluid in the abdomen is just academic because you're going to do surgery on that horse largely based on uncontrollable pain or just your clinical intuition. And you're right, I've had horses with dead bowel and normal belly taps and that's frustrating for everybody going in there but that's just it no one piece of information does it so um once you're in there and you've corrected things sometimes you can actually have a foreign body in the bowel what are some of the most unusual things that you've actually taken out of the intestinal tract of a horse um you know there's been lead ropes hay nets um plastic bags um, of course, they don't always resemble those things once you get once they get down far enough where they've been stuck. Um, but those are probably the most common things you see. That mm-hmm. I mean, horses will eat. They're kind of like dogs; they'll eat anything sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, some things pass, and some things stay in there long enough that they eventually cause an obstruction, and that's when you end up going in. That's and, what, that's what's interesting to me about a horse is that is you can feed them crushed up butte tablets in their grain and somehow they can pick around <laughs> it but they, they can't avoid eating a lead rope or a caterpillar or you know yeah. they, what, they, whatever it is they get bored sometimes so yeah they just start start chewing eating. on stuff and yeah pac-man those lead rope stories always wonder what happened to the person hanging on to the lead rope <laughs> or if one of the people in the barn is actually missing yeah when you do a head count <laughs> and then the horse ends up here with obstructed with a farm worker Unfortunately, there's no. They're more digestible than lead ropes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Uh, You got a few pictures to show us today. There's a couple. Some didn't make it across, I see. But um, so this is, let me show you this one first. Yeah. And for those of us that are not watching the video podcast, Scott's going to describe these in intimate detail. Yeah. So this was a horse that actually, this is from this year. And. I don't remember exact age. It was a young horse, like two, maybe a yearling or two year old, I think. And this horse came in colicking, didn't really know, thought it maybe small intestinal. We get in there, and the horse has got a jejunal ileal cecal in its deception. So his jejunum, which is the middle, the longest part of the small intestine, the ileum is the last part. So he's telescoped probably eight feet of intestine. So he's his, il- his, his jejunum has gone in through his ilium, all the way through his ilium, and it's now sitting inside of his cecum. So, which is not, it's very, very uncommon. So I was like, kind of, what the crap is going on? So I could feel this really firm piece in his cecum. And I'm like, oh, there's just no way we're going to get that back out, you know? And um, so, you know, I kept on working on it, working on it, and, you know, putting some tension on stuff and just, Eventually, this thing just popped out. And so this picture that you see is, you know, part of the intestine, but it had this thick mass um, sitting right in the middle of it. You know, initially I thought it was just intestine telescoped on itself, but it wasn't. And so um, when we cut into it, um, so obviously I had to take that out. And so we did a resection. And um, so when I opened up, so we did a resection, Got that out, was no, with that wasn't a big deal. And <clears throat> so when I open this thing up, you can see all the, there's this, the, the mucosa is all purple, and that's from being stuck inside. Had this really firm mass within the wall of the intestine. And how old was this horse again? Like two. Okay. The only two was relatively young. And so it had this, this big mass that was stuck inside the ilium, and, or inside its jejunum, sorry. And then, you, when you cut into it, it's just this really firm, dense, dense tissue. And occasionally, um, horses can get intestinal tumors just like anything else. But usually we see tumors in old horses, not young horses. But this is a tumor. It's called a lyomyoma, which is actually mm. a smooth muscle cell tumor. And the small intestine has muscle in it, 
That's how they propel things downstream when it contracts. So this is actually a smooth muscle tumor that the horse had developed, and that created an interluminal form body, you know, mass, and that's what caused it to get pulled on downstream and stuck into the cecum. So, you know, we did a resection on the horse, and, you know, that's what was my suspicion based upon what I found. It was going to be a lot of my own, and so I came back on histology, and, you know, the horse did fine. But that was kind of Horse a, did fine. Yeah. Huh. What do you think? I didn't think that was the outcome you'd get there. I did surgery. What do you think? <laughs> well, come on, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that was. A, it's uh, being recorded, so I can't tell you what I think. I'll tell yeah, you later. Yeah, yeah, later. Right, yeah. But I, but you, that was kind you of can give a, some hand signals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was kind of an interesting case, you know, because that was pretty unusual. Mm. So, um, the other thing, this other thing we had was, it was this was a probably a weanling. Um, probably for, from some farm that was poorly managed. It might have been your farm, Bart, actually. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so it was a winning came in for colic, took it to surgery. You know, we thought maybe small intestinal as well. Um, so when we opened it up, if you look, if you, I mean, if you're lucky enough to see the picture, this is a piece of small intestine. Now, this piece of intestine is really turgid like a sausage. And if you look, you see all these little white lines throughout the intestine everywhere? Those are worms. So those are all those are all strongyles, roundworms, where there's that are within the lumen of this horse's small intestine. So this horse had a um, had a you know ascarid impaction, right? Now the unfortunate part with this is that you know we got this horse too late and um, this foal already, already ruptured, and so let me show you this is. It's maybe gross for some people. It's cool for others. As you can see, the worms, maybe I'll, I'll play that again. If you watch, you know, the worm actually, so they're alive, so you're just crawling right out. So what happened is that because of the size of the impaction, it had split his mesentery, or split his intestine at the mesentery side, and he then had feces or had feed going into his mesentery. So you can see all the green. That's all feed in his mesentery. And then causing that peritonitis, and that's why all the worms are coming out. And, and unfortunately, you know, we had to put this, once they rupture, once a horse ruptures, there's no way to save them. So you have to put them down. Right. So obviously we were too late with this, but I've had them before where we've had to make an incision in the intestine and we just pull out worms. I couldn't find that video, but I've got some, we just got, we have a bowl, a big bowl of worms that we just pull out. That and I, I know you said it was poorly managed farm, but that's not necessarily true because no. I have had these from very well managed farms. And we had Dr. Nielsen on a few weeks ago t talking about the, the, the problems. And so the, sometimes the problem with these is you just, you don't know. Yeah. You, have, no. you have no idea until. Yeah. No. And the thing is, and it's like, I was just kidding about the poorly managed farm, but. Just, it was just a dig it. That's just a you. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Um, but this is basically, I mean, cause you will see them and there are well managed farms, but it just has to do with, you know, the, um, a lot of the wormers that we use aren't great anymore. Yeah, they've been used for so long. And there have many new wormers come out, and you know they aren't as effective. And so, so, some individual resistance issues too. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So, Immunity. So that was kind of a gross one, but but um, you know, interesting nonetheless. The last one is not truly a colic surgery. It's an it's abdominal surgery that we had. Now this I had a mare come in on emergency that they said. Uh, she got impaled by a board, right? So this is actually the, the, just a picture of the mare's abdomen. She's laying on her back and ready for colic surgery or for abdominal surgery. The mare went through, the board, went through a fence, and she had wood stuck into her abdominal cavity. So the owner actually had taken a sawzall and cut the board off. So you can see the cut end that he cut off and brought the mare in. So she came in just walking in. And they just got the mare like six months before. I didn't realize that she had been pasture bred, and she's pregnant as well. So they're getting two for the price of one. And so they brought this horse in. And, you know, of course, I'm telling them this is probably going to be a bad deal, you know, but they wanted, they wanted to try and go to surgery and see. And I said, we don't know what's going to happen unless we go in there and see. You know, like this is one we did do a belly tap on, but couldn't prove that she had ruptured anything of that nature. So we took and did an exploratory. And so, um, you know, like this is like the tip of the iceberg. You never really know what you're going to find to get in there. Now... This is what came out. Now, that's a sheet. Of, that's a that's a full sheet of a of um, paper towel. So that's like what about a foot? Oh those my. are about a, those are about 
15, 18 inches long pieces of, of fence board that were in her abdominal cavity. And she did not puncture a thing. Now, the thing that saved her was the fact she was pregnant. Because what happened is when that board went in, I could see where it had glanced off the uterus because mm. she had a she had a little excoriation in her uterus. So it hit the uterus and bounced off and didn't put it through mesentery, didn't put it through a piece of intestine, nothing. So, you know, you know, the big thing with these is oh, she's gonna get bad peritonitis and stuff like that. But we you know, and she's pregnant. She's due and this man was due any time roughly. I mean, she was pretty pretty far along. And the mayor actually did great. The foe fold in the clinic. And I'm not sure who had it. I think maybe Bonnie had mm-hmm. it. Fold in the clinic. Foe had a couple of issues but did fine. So, I mean, they were here for a little bit. But, you know, both mom and baby went home, and it was it was good. It was just, it was the surprising that she had not just torn herself up inside. It was but, amazing. And, you know, when we pulled it out, I was like, holy crap it's just the board just kept on coming i thought it'd be in a few inches or something but it just kept on coming and coming and coming it was a pretty amazing mm, that is amazing that is amazing were you worried about that when you laid her down that you know that was gonna well that's the, well that was the, the we had to take some precautions laying her down yeah right because she wasn't a really big mare um you know she's a smaller quarter horse type mare so but the my big the big concern laying her down is that i couldn't have her drop on her abdomen Right, mm. I couldn't take her the risk of her pushing that board back up further into, into her intestinal or her abdominal cavity. So, you know, she was small enough that we could, you know, when she started to go down, we could pull her over on her side before she could hit the ground. And which, you know, that could be harder than an older horse, but um, luckily we had, you know, enough people here that we were able just to take and pull her on her side as soon as she started to crouch down, got her on her side before her abdomen could hit and, and push those boards back up in her abdominal cavity different. So any further, it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of luck involved there. What, what's the prognosis for these horses post colic surgery? I know it depends on the problem, but in yeah. your experience, I mean, it's. I think people are. I mean, what surprises me all the time is people always ask, "Well, so what, what can my horse do after colic surgery? So what can they do?" It's, it's like you know, if they make it. They're not sure if they can go back and ride them again or show them again. And it's like, it's pretty much an all or none. Either they do great and they survive and they go home and can do whatever they were doing before, you know, or they get sick and have problems in some of the ones that are really bad and don't make it. But if they do well post-op and go home, they can go back and show, race, jump, do whatever, you know, for the most part. So, um, you know, prognosis is really dependent upon what you have. And what they have. I mean, there's certain ones that have a, little, have a slightly, higher, slightly higher complication rate than others. Um, but, you know, I would say the large majority of them do quite well. I mean, you never get, I mean, you can tell people percentages and roughly how well you think their horse is going to do. Because everyone wants to know right after surgery, how's my horse going to do? Is he going to be good? Is he going to be okay? But there's some that you think are going to do great. For whatever reason, just tank. Don't do well. So, I mean, you're always a little bit cautiously optimistic. You don't want to be prominent on the moon when you're, you know, one hour post-op, mm. you know, so. so. So if you're buying a horse, though, say it's in, in competition, it's in racing, and it's had a colic surgery, how much does that factor in? Should that factor into people's decisions? Um, because, you know, we, we know that there's a recurrence rate that's, that's higher than the average horse in the, in the population. Well, if you have an idea of what the horse had, and what they had done at surgery, I think they can kind of guide you a little bit. Because if, you, if you're buying a horse that ha- had a, a volvulus, so we know that they have a roughly a one in five chance of recurring again. So that's the risk that you take. And, you know, if a horse had a small intestinal resection, I mean, mo- a lot of those do really well. Now, full surgeries are different. Foals want to develop adhesions to everything. But with that said, the large majority of foals that we cut that are just small intestinal valvuses, if they do well post-op and go home, they do great. We don't see them back for it. We don't, it's mm-hmm. a very rare one that we cut a second time because they have adhesions. The ones that have adhesions, you know, are mostly foals. And those happen when we have to do a resection in a foal. Those are the ones that are at a, at a higher risk. But, you know, we've had cases before, and I'm sure I've had them with Peter, is, you know, some of the foals, when they're born, if the mare stands up too quick or whatever, they'll actually rupture their umbilicus and they'll eviscerate intestine right out of their umbilicus. 
usually that, that is like that's a kiss of death. I mean, they, you get exposed by like that, they don't. You might as well put them down in most cases. But we've had a couple, and I remember there's a saddlebred baby we had that came from Louisville that they called. You know, I told them what to do. And they had two guys in the back of the trailer. They kept the foal on its back. By the time it got here, it had a bandage with some small intestines poking out. But none of the mesentery was torn. The bile was inflamed but not dead. And, you know, we went through painstakingly cleaning every little tiny bit of shavings and straw off of it and everything. And Lavage's abdomen afterwards. And that little stinker did great. You know, and... But, you know, I didn't, I had a picture of that too from earlier this spring. We had one that came in that, you know, all of his intestines were all just, the mesentery's all torn and everything. So that one just got put down right away. Um, but the adhesions, mostly in adults, you know, we see some occasionally, but even the small intestinal resection horses, I said that's more the exception than the rule as far as it, adhesions go. Um, and, uh, you know, because we, we try to do our best to try to prevent adhesions from forming. Um, but there's no great way to prevent abdominal adhesions, especially in foals. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you know the medicine guys do, and uh, as well um, to try to prevent that because that's really the biggest thing in foals, particularly adults. It's not so we still do stuff, but it's not quite to the same degree as foals. So, you know, if they do well post op, I mean, that's I mean they can go ahead and do whatever. But it's I mean, all those horses are going to take a hit when they get sold. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. if they're sold to sale, that they're always going to take a hit because I mean. It's not like, the, I mean, they've had an abdominal surgery, so it's um, it's always going to knock them, no matter what, even though, you know, if it had, a, if it had a, basically a displacement or nephrosplenic, which is not a big deal, that people are like, I don't want to deal with that. Gotcha. That's just the way it is. Gotcha. So sh- people should factor it in, but not necessarily completely avoid them. No, as a buyer, it may be a good way to get a deal. There you go. Yeah, it never ceases to amaze me how well some of these do, especially some of those you know, near nature talked about. They come in the violently painful. You get in there, you flip things around, clean it up, put it back in, and a couple of days they're up there looking for a feed. You know? And, um, yeah, they can be complicated managements post-surgery, and I'll get you to comment on how you manage your colic cases post-surgery. But for the neonates, I mean, just a little bit of a baby along, and they're very young, they're very elastic, and they actually do remarkably well. But what's your philosophy on managing your patients post surgery um part of it depends on the kind of colic that it is you know um but for the most part they're on antibiotics for at least three days and banamine um as well as iv fluids for the first few days post-op and then if their white count's normal then we'll stop antibiotics after three days and you know the tip the premise the routine colic is they go home about the fifth day after surgery depending um, small intestinal cases, those can take and linger a little bit just mm-hmm. because some of them want to develop ileus where their intestines is just not working quite right, so they want to reflux a little bit. You have to go slower to put them back on feed. They could be here longer, just depending on if they develop that or not. Um, plus, usually if they've had a resection, then we're, abdominal, we're doing abdominal lavages on them. That's our way to try to prevent adhesions is um, to do an abdominal lavage on them a couple times a day for like three days. So it takes a little bit longer to get them out. But usually it's five, six days and they're back home. So, but, you know, you get the really severe ones, I mean, that are endotoxemic and everything else where you've got to pour, you know, you're doing all the anti-endotoxic drugs and everything else at them, plasma and everything, trying to um, keep them going. So, but the routine colics, it's pretty cookbook, so to speak. Mm Mm-hmm. And the incision, the body wall, how does that heal up afterwards? Is it as good as it was before, better, not as strong? They're very resilient. I mean, the horses that get abdominal surgery are pretty good. If you've ever had, know of anyone, or if you've ever had abdominal surgery yourself, you don't feel like moving because mm-hmm. everything hurts. Abdominal incisions in people are, are pretty painful, but horses don't give a crap. They're really good about it. Um, they heal well. I mean, usually they got about 50% of their strength by 30 days. Um and um, they're ready to get turned out by that point in time, as long as they haven't developed an incisional infection. That's the big thing. If they get an incisional infection, that puts everything back. And because um, it takes them longer to heal, takes them longer for body wall to regain strength. Strength. Some of those horses will develop incisional um, hernias as a consequence of having an incisional infection. And those hernias can be small little finger punctate ones to, to 
having a sack of potatoes hanging from their abdominal wall from their you know underneath them you can see really easy and have to be repaired at a later date mm -hmm. um but as far as far as strength of the incision they heal pretty quick and you know we've had mares full within hours after colic surgery mm. you know and that's the I mean when you're a young surgeon starting, you're like, oh, my God, is this going to all come apart? <laughs> you know, that's your fear. It's just going to blow apart. But they don't. They all hold. And um, so it's like on pregnant mares, you know, we don't take the baby unless we absolutely have to take them because you don't know if they're quite fully cooked or not. Mm -hmm. So we leave them in. But, like, you know, we've all had them full, like, very shortly after colic surgery and do fine. That's yeah. a lot of pressure. That's a lot of that yeah. That totally totally amazed me how that suture line can hold, yeah. and it can hold the weight of that horse, the tension across the incision line, and they just heal up. It's um, it's a testament mm -hmm. to suture material and technique. And, really the, is. and the horse itself. And the horse itself, yeah. yeah. They're so tolerant of it. Yeah. Yep, they are for sure. Good. Okay. Any uh, any more questions for our guest? No, I think so. Thank you for coming in with us. Those are those are some neat uh, pictures you showed us and. Pretty cool cases. Yeah. Gone from the routine to the not-so-routine and all in the career of Scott Hopper, which uh, is still ongoing. I've, I've appreciated some of those late-night calls I get, and I go, just let Hopper deal with it. <laughs> just, like, just, just, roll like over and, just rolls over and goes back to sleep, puts the phone down. <laughs> he never even answers the phone at night. <laughs> That's not true. It's just, he just really <laughs> <did>. <laughs> Yeah, somebody's lying. Okay, well, again, Scott, thanks for your time today. It's been a pleasure, very interesting. And uh, for the audience, that was Dr. Scott Hopper talking about a little bit of his career and also colic in the horse with some unusual presentations. See you next time. Thanks. Thanks.